This video contains mind-blowing mysteries that all occurred in the Pacific Northwest, from severed feet washing up on shore year after year in Washington State, and an unidentified demonic screeching sound that plagued a small town in Oregon in 2016, to an unidentifiable charred corpse found at the bottom of an inaccessible smokestack. These true unsolved mysteries are fascinating to say the least. And there's something about the Pacific Northwest that seems like the perfect backdrop for crazy mysteries and unexplained phenomena. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like it and subscribe to my channel for more dark and mysterious content. Anyway, let's dive in. In February of 2016, a small, quiet town in Oregon called Forest Grove had its stillness shattered by a horrifying sound that would emanate throughout the town, but only at night. The sound was described in many ways. Some of those descriptions included an otherworldly shrieking, a mechanical scream, a bad, one-note violin solo broadcast over a microphone with non-stop feedback, Satan's tea kettle, and a train screeching wildly over metal tracks, except there was no train nearby. The sound could last as little as 10 seconds or as long as several minutes at a time, and residents of Forest Grove said the sound seemed to emanate from nowhere and everywhere all at once. At first it was just an annoyance, but as time went on, more news outlets began picking up this mysterious story, and soon it was national news. That was a big deal for Forest Grove, a small town of only 22,000 residents, and trying to determine the origin of the notorious noise quickly became a pastime for local residents. Then, a physics professor named Andrew Dawes at Pacific University nearby created a crowdsourced map and encouraged other locals to drop a pin where they heard the noise and note the date and time, in hopes of collecting enough data to draw a solid conclusion about the source of the noise. Unfortunately, the resulting pins didn't point to any single location, as the sound appeared to come from everywhere all at once. Then, the newspaper The Oregonian published an extensive list of hypotheses from around the country, and even overseas, to explain the mysterious noise. Some of the humorous but less than educated guesses included mating Sasquatch, an alien mothership attempting contact, mating drumfish, and finally the sound of the seven trumpets that biblically indicate the end of time. Eventually, the Department of Forestry determined that their equipment in the area was not the source of the noise, and neither the City of Forest Grove Public Works Department nor the Fire Department were able to explain where it was coming from, other than some speculation that it was occurring near Gales Creek Road. Then, in late February of 2016, the Forest Grove Police announced via Facebook that the noise did not pose a safety hazard and that they were halting their investigation until further information appeared. Eventually, hundreds of guesses, theories, and even ideas to muffle the noise began overloading phone and email servers at the local fire department and city hall, which prompted police to issue a light-hearted but firm warning. In a statement on February 24th, the Forest Grove Police Department said, While there is some fun with the outrageous theories, we think we have literally heard them all. No, really, we have. We also made it clear that we firmly believe there is a logical explanation and that we can't condone what might be a prank. While some might find it comical, interesting, and mysterious, it is unlawful if it's being done on purpose. If this is the case, the individual caught will face possible repercussions. Three days later, the noise apparently came to a halt. The police department stopped receiving reports about it, and the last pin was dropped on physicist Andrew Daw's map on February 27th. For that reason, Forest Grove Police Captain Mike Erb thinks the sound probably stemmed from a prank, but he says he's never confirmed this. Meanwhile, Dave Nemeyer, the Forest Grove Fire Marshal, suspects the noise to be a faulty attic fan or heat pump. While those would both be potentially disappointingly mundane explanations, no hard evidence has ever arisen to indicate the true cause of the bizarre noise, and, after February 27th, the noise was never heard again. On New Year's Day in 2019, 
Beachgoers in Washington State found a boot with a human foot inside it at the south end of Jetty Island. No other human remains were found. It turns out, that foot belonged to a man named Antonio O'Neill, who was 22 years old when his family reported a missing in December of 2016. That finding followed a report from May of 2018 that a man found a lone right foot wearing a hiking boot wedged between logs in the same area. The year before that, a foot wearing a black Velcro running shoe with some of the leg bones still attached was found washed up on another beach in the area. That foot was traced to a Stanley Okamoto, who was 79 when he went missing in September of 2017. These discoveries are part of an ongoing pattern that's been observed since 2007, and, since then, at least 21 detached human feet have washed up on the shores of the Salish Sea in the Pacific Northwest. This pattern has been a source of fascination for Canadians and Americans living in the Pacific Northwest for years, and the phenomenon even has its own dedicated Wikipedia page. In fact, the BC Coroner Service, which is apparently the organization you call if you happen to stumble upon a disembodied foot, put together the following map illustrating the pattern, although it doesn't contain some of the latest finds. The theories about what's going on here range from the scientifically plausible to the fantastical, depending on who you ask. Some speculate that the feet are from people who died in the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, while others suggest that they could be from plane crash victims. Some speculate that they could be the result of human trafficking, or even a product of alien abductions. However, one of the most commonly proposed explanations, at least on social media, has been that a potential serial killer, maybe even one with a foot fetish, could be to blame for the feet washing ashore. So what's really going on here? Originally, in 2007, two feet washed ashore just a few days apart from each other. At that point, some suggested that they could have come from those who had died in a 2005 plane crash near Quandra Island. The idea was that their bodies were most likely eaten by marine life, with the shoes and feet eventually floating to the surface due to the buoyancy of modern shoes. This theory sounded reasonable at the time, but then more and more feet showed up. Only five men died in the plane crash near Quandra Island, but there have been at least 21 feet found on the shores of the Salish Sea in total so there has to be another explanation. Unfortunately, there have been some complications in the quest to clear up this mystery, as pranksters in the area have tried to replicate the phenomenon by placing animal paws in shoes and leaving them on the beach for someone to find. The police have warned against this behavior, saying they'll prosecute people who perpetrate these hoaxes, but that hasn't deterred everyone. One foot found in mid-2008 turned out to be a skeletonized animal paw within a sock shoved inside a shoe. Then, in 2011, other sneakers were discovered with raw meat inside them. Putting the pranks aside, in order to determine the real cause of this mystery, we're going to need a scientific approach. In 2007, forensic scientist Gail Anderson used pig carcasses released into the Salish Sea to examine the effects of sea life and decomposition on the remains. Interestingly, she discovered that the marine life on the sea floor can strip a carcass in as few as four days. Apparently, because our ankles are primarily composed of soft tissue, the sea creatures are able to easily consume the area around the ankles, allowing the feet to float to the surface due to the buoyancy of modern tennis shoes. Then, due to patterns of currents specific to the Salish Sea, the feet often wash up on shore after drifting inland from tides, currents, and winds. Plus, the waters in the Pacific Northwest are exceptionally cold, which prevents the feet from decaying as quickly as they otherwise would. Also, according to Laura Yazdegen, a human identification specialist for the BC Coroner Service, the term severed is not accurate when describing these disembodied feet. The term severed implies that the feet were intentionally cut off from the body which doesn't seem to be happening here. According to scientists, these feet are naturally detaching from the bodies due to decomposition. So, rather than severed, they're actually disarticulated or detached from the corpses. So, assuming the feet mostly belong to murder victims, victims of accidental drowning, and people who took their own life, why aren't feet like these washing up all over the world? As I mentioned earlier, the currents specific to the Salish Sea are actually pretty unique. A scientist named Parker McCready of the University of Washington built a 3D ocean current simulator specifically for the Pacific Northwest region to determine where oil spills might wash up. But he also used the model to help answer the mystery of the washed up feet. A unique mix of the shape of the Salish Sea, combined with prevailing wind patterns, makes the area a perfect trap for tennis shoe clad disembodied feet. So we can answer the question of how the feet end up there, but not necessarily why, as the circumstances surrounding each death are probably different. Therefore, the real enduring mystery in this case is the question of how each of these people met their tragic ends.
1987, the skeleton of an unknown man was found in the smokestack of a Bellingham pulp mill. The body is still unidentified, and nobody knows how it got there. Around 5 a.m. on September 20th, 1987, a worker named Roy Harris at Bellingham's Georgia Pacific West checked boiler number 9, one of 10 of the plant and one that stood often unused. Harris was responding to an alarm indicating a potential steam pipe leak, which was apparently a pretty common occurrence. He opened the boiler lid and peered inside, and instantly spotted the remains of a human skeleton resting atop some metal pipes, 17 feet down from the opening. The worker immediately called the police, and that's where this mystery begins. After an analysis by local law enforcement, the victim was determined to most likely be male, with a confidence level of 95%. Unfortunately, the boiler was fired with the corpse inside around September 18th, exposing the remains to a scorching 370 degrees Fahrenheit for 34 hours. This made it essentially impossible to collect any useful forensic information from the charred skeleton. Collecting what information they could, police determined the victim was Caucasian, though possibly Native American as well, with an estimated age between between 20 and 40. He stood 5'8 to 5'9 and weighed approximately 130 to 160 pounds. It was difficult to determine exactly how long the remains were inside the smokestack, with estimates varying from a few days to several months. He was found wearing rubber soled size 8 men's shoes, denim pants and a denim jacket, a lightweight shirt, and socks with his shirt wrapped around his ankle. An autopsy revealed he had fractured his thigh bones, lower leg bones, and two bones in his right arm, injuries he probably sustained following the 17 plus feet into the boiler. Some reports indicate he was found with his socks on his hands, but that detail isn't confirmed. Interestingly, a wallet was found with his remains that contained the charred remnants of a Continental Airlines ticket or baggage claim check. Unfortunately, the ticket was too damaged to make out any flight numbers, but this could suggest that the mystery man isn't from the state of Washington. The Georgia Pacific plant itself had 10 boilers. The one in which the corpse was found, number 9, was used the least. It was rather secluded and the route to it was long and difficult to navigate. First you'd have to climb up several flights of stairs, then make your way to the roof. You could then either try to climb up a ladder, which would have been surrounded by chain link fencing with a locked door, or precariously scramble up pipes and catwalks. The boiler itself was around 10 feet wide, with 11 parallel steel pipes carrying dangerously hot water 17 feet down from the opening above. These are the pipes on which the man was laying. Apparently, the plant was not very well guarded. There were few people working in the plant at any given time, and there was no fence around the facility, even though it was located in a very accessible region of Bellingham. Apparently, strange people were reported to have shown up on the property pretty regularly. The actual cause of death of the mystery man is up for debate. An organization called the Doe Network used to list the cause of death as hypothermia, which is actually possible. We know the man broke several bones during his fall into the boiler, and Washington is fairly cold during the September months, with the average temperature of 1987's Labor Day weekend in Bellingham dropping as low as 30 degrees Fahrenheit. However, this guess of death by hypothermia assumes the boiler was turned off at the time of his death. The opposite of hypothermia, hyperthermia, seems like an equally probable cause of death, because falling into the boiler while it's running would inevitably cause the victim to burn to death in the extreme heat, assuming they don't die of heat stroke first. Alternatively, toxic gases within the boiler could have suffocated the man, and he also could have bled out due to his many fractures. So let's talk about possible theories that could explain this mystery. One suggestion, posted on the forum Web Sleuths, proposes that the man entered the plant over Labor Day weekend from September 4th to the 8th of 1987, as the plant was closed for the long weekend. Thrill seekers climb industrial settings like this all the time, and, unfortunately, with the lid of Boiler 9 left open, this man could have simply fell in. One very intriguing component of this case is an anonymous tip that was received at one point during the investigation. The tipster said a group of thrill seekers used to climb around this facility. If they feared detection, they would blow a whistle and the group would meet up at a set location. The tip stated that a man from New York, who recently joined the group, failed to meet up at their set location once the whistles were blown and they simply never saw him again. If this tip is true and the mystery man is from New York, it could explain why he had an airline ticket in his wallet. Let's move on to another theory, although to me this one seems a little less likely. At a different plant in the Bellingham area, a man named Richard Severson claimed he gave a tour to a wiry white woman who was 30 to 40 years old, with light to medium brown hair, between 5'4 and 5'6, and wore a lined windbreaker, woven blouse, jeans, and tennis shoes. He said this woman acted very strangely around the boilers. 
Bizarrely, she asked to go inside an active boiler, which Severson refused. He then directed her to an inactive boiler, where the woman entered and exited several times, and then sat atop the pipes. Concerned, Severson then asked her to leave. This theory suggests that this strange woman is the person found dead in the other boiler. Keep in mind, the police are 95% sure the unknown victim is a male, and the clothing found is of a traditionally masculine nature, but there is always a slim chance it was actually a female. Regarding additional theories, there's a lot of crazy stuff out there. I've read things ranging from a stowaway who fell out of a plane, to D.B. Cooper, to murder and suicide. Some have even suggested that the victim could have been suffering from a mental breakdown, similar to the Elisa Lamb case. Unfortunately, we just can't say for sure. One thing we can say for sure, though, is that the victim was not an employee of Georgia Pacific. No paychecks went unclaimed, no workers were reported missing, and the man was not found wearing steel-toed boots, which all of the employees were required to wear. At one point, Bellingham police supposedly had a possible match in a man missing from Vancouver, Canada, but police couldn't find any evidence of him ever crossing the border. The DNA of the mystery man is irretrievable due to searing heat, and fingerprints were also impossible to collect, so they couldn't find a match that way. The police were able to analyze the teeth of the corpse for dental record comparison, but the missing man from Vancouver did not have any available dental records, and police have not named the man publicly. All in all, this is a truly baffling case, and at this point it seems like we may never have any solid answers. Still, I'd love to see it solved. If you think you might have any useful information, no matter how small, please do contact the authorities. Nobody should pass away in complete anonymity against their will. Well, those are today's three unsolved mysteries of the Pacific Northwest. I hope you enjoyed listening. If you did, please do like the video and feel free to subscribe to my channel for more dark and mysterious content. If there's any topic you'd like to see me cover in a future video, I'd love to hear about it in the comment section below. Regardless, I've got a long list of ideas for future videos and I'm looking forward to making the next one. Anyway, thanks for watching.